Hey there, everybody. Uni Young here, and I uh, thought I would make a special video about uh, what's happening today. It's uh, the 22nd of November, uh, 2021, and uh, today, or from this point forward, we will be entering the 19th year of the Hanfu movement. Uh, the Hanfu movement uh, is marked by a watershed moment that is being uh, Zhong Zhiling Yun or Wang Letian, the electrician from Zhengzhou, China, smack dab in the middle, uh, going onto the streets and uh, being filmed by this team of people uh, and live cast of him wearing hanfu, going about uh, riding a bus, buying groceries and stuff like that, spending a day in clothing like this, which was uh, pretty revolutionary at the time because uh, at back uh, 18 years ago, nobody would have fathomed doing this unless uh, you were purportedly uh, Korean, Japanese, uh, filming a TV or movie. Um, or you were uh, a Buddhist monk or a Taoist priest or that you were Korean or Japanese and that led to you probably being beaten up by some uh, more angry youth. So that was a sea change and uh, we have come a long way in uh, having this kind of clothing be recognized as the uh, traditional clothing of the Han Chinese people one of the uh, 56 officially recognized categories of uh, ethnicities in on Chinese soil. Um, long history, long problem with that. And uh, we can basically describe the long journey that we've had in two major uh, divisions. So, uh, as I said, we will be entering the 19th year of the movement. So let's just say that we are uh, having two decades of history with us. So uh, the first 10 years can be described as uh, a little before 2003 up to 2013. And the second half of it is from 2013 to presumably 2023. And perhaps there's more to come, hopefully, forward. So let's talk about uh, this movement uh, and how it started in the first 10 years. So uh, the Hanfu movement is an international movement, although it may deal with the Han ethnicity, the Han people, that doesn't mean that it's strictly a PRC uh, Chinese movement. The movement first started on Hanwang, the internet website, but uh, Really, the people who participate there involve uh, people who live overseas or study overseas. For example, just half a year or a few months before uh, Wang Letian took to the streets, the first person to actually post a picture uh, with people making uh, their own set of clothes and um, posting a selfie and with the intent of saying, here I am uh, wearing this kind of clothing, this is the kind of clothing that represents the Han ethnicity, not the other Manchurian influence or Manchurian imposed kind of dress, was uh, made by Wang Yuliang, uh, a student at the time studying in Australia. And the first uh, associations that were founded outside of China uh, were found in Toronto and in Malaysia. And uh, that still continues to be places where the movement is still quite active even today. So uh, the development of the Hanfu movement uh, in the first 10 years comes from the uh, opportunity at the time that China was rapidly entering the global market. And when I say market, that comes in two major ideas. One is money, uh, commodities, that things can be bought, sold, traded, and given a value. And the second is the marketplace of ideas, where uh, new ideas, new ways of thinking about things are given value and work hand in hand with how we uh, give value to things in the former sense. 
uh, the money market. So, in the early days of the movement, we were arguing uh, about all these things about like uh, Chinese ethnic policy dealing with the, the status of the Han, as to what it means to be a uh, Han person with a respect for the past and a reverence for the future and other ethnic groups and their heritage as well. So uh, people started experimenting with different ideas. So ideologically wise, uh, you have a mix anywhere from uh, abolishing the unfair practices of the one child policy only applying to Han and several other majority uh, ethnic minorities in China uh, to the unfair practice of the Gaokao or the high school to university entrance exams uh, with the ethnic minorities having oh, artificially boosted or elevated scores. These political issues are being uh, carried and transferred along with the promotion of this kind of clothing in China in the early days. But what happens to those people who are not affected by Chinese internal policies? What does this clothing mean for us aside from uh, well, these clothes look awesome, let's wear it. So, uh, in Malaysia, for example, uh, promoting traditional Chinese culture and promoting Hanfu to them suddenly becomes, ah, we should respect that the fact that uh, our community, our Chinese community there, uh, existed all the way from the Song Dynasty to the Ming to the present. A lot of those communities have ancestral halls that span all the way uh, from be to before the Manchu invasion of China proper. So by wearing this kind of clothing, they will be being true and authentic to the history of their communities over there, as well as uh, uh, following a continuation of true representation of their actual heritage which mostly stem from southern coastal China. As for places like um, the Europe or North America, which uh, their communities span mostly because of uh, first Qing uh, influences, uh, the Q order and so forth, and then once again the second layer of imperialism with uh, the Opium War and uh, the coolie trade and thereby spreading Chinatowns all over the West, uh, to them, this kind of clothing is a bit more foreign, a bit more new, in the sense that uh, these communities did not have a history of those people who founded them wearing this kind of clothing. Instead, they're more found in temples and uh, learning in the literature, in the classroom textbooks, and uh, memories of what it means to be aesthetically Chinese back then. But to them, uh, in the West, they did not practice it. So in a way, uh, they would be dealing with a completely new layer of meaning uh, into the present and the future with uh, wearing this kind of clothing. And of course, uh, a deeper layer of reconciliation with the effects of imperialism and colonialism uh, by the Western powers and the Manchu Qing as well. And this is a common legacy that uh, Everyone, no matter those who are in the uh, western part of the diaspora, the Southeast Asian part of the diaspora, or even China itself, has to deal with. And that's the fun part about the uh, underlying common denominator about this movement, linking everyone together around the world. Uh, so, as I was saying, uh, the commodification of this idea and linking uh, the Han Chinese people together, uh, no matter what their political beliefs are today, is a very powerful underlying factor that uh, links all of these Chinese people or Han Chinese people together. But at the same time, that means pulling very different uh, ideological beliefs that define the very fragmented nature of the Chinese community today. Uh, so things from like a um, political spectrum from left to right, the belief that uh, whether things should be 
leaning more towards ideological preservation and promotion to uh, believing that things have to be materialized into something in order to be expressed. So commodification. And uh, let's talk about the other part, commodification. So uh, in the promotion of uh, Hanfu, our success today did not uh, come up smoothly as a linear form of uh, development. So there was a strong argument back in 2006 to 2008 or so uh, whether, every, uh, whether how Hanfu should be promoted uh, and proliferated. So some people thought uh, we should make it as cheap as possible so that everyone could afford to buy it. Whereas another group uh, believed that we should make it into items and objects of desire. They should be promoted as images of an idealized past and full of bling bling. That they should be uh, full of embroidery. They should be finely made and cut so that and uh, properly promoted with uh, sharp images and uh, studio quality photography. And after all those arguments, each side put to the test. If you were to ask us around 10 or maybe just 5 years ago, you would see that uh, the other party, the latter half, the elite side won with uh, the Ming style fashion and of t uh, taking the lead, Ming Hua Tong, forming this idea that Ming cutting is elite. Ming cutting is worth more money. It's more expensive to buy and Ming kind of clothing is uh, more embroidery, more flowery, uh, stiffer materials, looks more formal, just looks better. And uh, that, that set off the first trend in the Hanfu fashion world. Today, however, uh, beginning from, say, 2018, 2019, and particularly in industry reports coming in 2020, we see that uh, trend is actually making an interesting turn. Um, with the industries of scale now producing uh, more and more uh, Hanfu makers in China, we're seeing uh, more and more uh, competitive products that are being produced instead of hundreds if not thousands of Chinese yuan, they can create similar quality, similar featured uh, products that can be sold for only tens if not early hundreds of Chinese yuan. So uh, very cheap in other words. So whether that uh, final debate in whether uh, this uh, cheap products means the quick expansion of the market works or not fails really is a cycle of uh, the industry. So perhaps the story is too, uh, too early to tell which idea really persists, or maybe that uh, the pursuit of uh, the high-end haute couture sort of stuff, or whether the uh, pedestrian, the common, the mass-produced, prêt à porter style kind of fashion, one wins or the other loses, or is it a mutual relationship, a cycle uh, between this and that? And uh, it's an interesting developing story, so let's keep an eye on it and uh, see what happens. I mean, right now, uh, the Ming fashion is finally seeing a cycle into the Jin and then later the Song fashion today. So nowadays, Song fashion with uh, the female fashion preferring long pleated trousers, wide trousers, simple colors, and instead of the uh, trapezoidal or the uh, triag uh, triangular kind of cutting shape, it's now more towards the tubular and uh, wide shape. So who knows what uh, the future will bring. So uh, yes. Uh, with this kind of uh, history moving forward, let's take a look back and how uh, we developed into this kind of trend uh, or cycle that we're developing. So back in 2008, 2008 uh, we had the chance of uh, presenting Hanfu as 
the representative clothing of uh, the Chinese nation, the Chinese country, uh, and that did not work in uh, the Beijing Olympics. And they had a second chance in 2009 to 2011 with uh, the Shanghai Expo. But uh, despite the two tries, they were they never gained the uh, official uh, discourse, the official dialogue of the state. So the state never fully endorsed Hanfu and the Hanfu movement before 2012. So you see back in 2009 and 2012, there were incidents where uh, people wearing Hanfu were disparaged and uh, even assaulted by angry mobs, mistaking them for various things, anywhere from uh, Japanese clothing and anti-Japanese sentiment uh, marches, or even uh, just simply strange and weird clothing by certain individuals in places of power. That started to change in 2012 uh, and forward, when the regime uh, changed its turn. So from the Hu Jintao Wen Jiabao regime switched to the Xi Jinping regime in 2013. Nobody knew at the uh, start what that meant, like the era change, well, we all do now, but uh, at the beginning, what does it mean to have a leader change, and what did that mean to uh, the future of the Hanfu movement? Uh, beginning in 2015 and onwards, we saw that uh, aside from a more changing uh, attitudes towards the West and outside, so China began uh, closing itself from the outside world, but news was doesn't just simply close off like that. And um, we see the Chinese government using uh, tradition and nationalism as uh, more of a justification for its legitimacy. And one of those strange things that happened was that Hanfu began uh, to be more widely accepted in the government's discourse or the party's discourse. And uh, there are two ways of understanding this. One is a top-down approach, as I've just discussed, uh, nationalism as part of a legitimacy plan. Second thing is all those youth who were participating in the Hanfu movement, meaning us, we are grown up, we've grown up, we've uh, entered the job market, and uh, we've become the mainstay of society. So what happened was, uh, a lot of people in China, and uh, without, of course, outside of China, worked to promote this kind of clothing. Uh, we became part of companies, organizations, uh, the Chinese Communist Party cadres, and they started promoting their ideas about promoting Hanfu at, in tandem with uh, the official state doctrine. And what happened was that um, increasingly, uh, not the party itself, but the Communist Youth League, who handles um, cultural and internal affairs that was not like outright political doctrine, uh, started promoting Hanfu, but with one exception. Because the party has to maintain a party line that they need to care for the representation of all the other 55 mi uh, ethnic minorities as well. So when they promote Hanfu, they had this strange consideration and they said, no, if we're going to promote Hanfu, we need to promote all the other ethnicities as well. So they changed the term of Hanfu into Huafu instead. And when they started in 2016, uh, this thing called Huafu Day, uh, the category of Huafu did not just only include Hanfu, but also uh, clothing from all the other different ethnicities and per time periods as well, which of course includes the clothing that the Hanfu movement excluded into in the first place because that confused the image of the Han uh, in the first place. So it's really odd that uh, it comes back in, although we try to downplay that uh, kind of uh, confusing image and everyone who's heard of or seen the Hanfu movement knows what's going on. 
Officially, Huafu and Hanfu mean quite different things, but uh, they are uh, blocked or uh, limited by the need of having to express this official doctrine uh, that they have to express it, that it is inclusive of all these other ethnicities into wearing uh, their own traditional clothing as well, but somehow it's Han, and Han is somehow everyone. So it's confusing. So what do we do uh, with the Hanfu movement uh, when this kind of change is happening on the mainland? Doctrine is not simply dictated by uh, the, Ill, the will and the means of the Chinese government, because this movement is a grassroots movement, and it started online, and the participation uh, of it is from within China and outside. We, as uh, people who wear Hanfu and enjoy Hanfu and understand the meaning of the movement since its inception, have a responsibility of continuing uh, the original mandate and the original mission of truth and reconciliation of Han identity, uh, and what it means to return this uh, legacy of colonialism, imperialism, and cultural appropriation of another onto our own, reflect on that and to put it in its rightful place and of course return that culture to its original owners. It's important for us to continue this kind of legacy. So for those of us who are outside, for those of us who continue this movement and promote these ideas in Southeast Asia, in North America, in Europe, we need to remember that and keep that as our first and primary message. So how do we do that? Aside from wearing this kind of clothing, saying that it's great, and uh, we should promote this kind of clothing uh, towards the, not just the Chinese community to wherever we're living, but to also have this kind of experience wearing this kind of clothing uh, be uh, shared with all the different uh, ethnic groups and communities of our own locales. And when we share this experience of wearing this kind of clothing, we should also uh, promote the experience of what it means to respect our heritage, how we do that, go through the rituals and uh, practices and arts of our community, and more importantly, not have to rely on uh, or over-rely on the failings of the modern commoditized uh, market mode of operation. As I said before, the Hanfu movement is able to modernize not because of ideology, not because of ideology, but uh, commodification. So people are able to accept Hanfu in the 21st century is because we explored and we luckily succeeded in commoditizing the clothing and uh, not the ideology. The ideology came after that and it's not a must that you follow a certain form of Han ideology in order to wear the clothes. You learn about it as you wear the clothes. So the clothes come first. And as we commoditize with cheap clothing, expensive clothing, a lot of them have to be imported from China, from where we are sitting in perhaps a, a not China outside of it. So we have to buy it in forms of uh, Taobao or group order shipments, uh, and we have to ask our friends to buy it. And increasingly it's becoming more convenient, uh, especially now through the pandemic and everyone is increasingly relying on internet shopping and uh, just-in-time logistics. And we know from recent news that uh, the world logistics global chain, the supply chain is becoming increasingly uh, stressed because of it. Uh, we're having uh, breakdowns and overworking of uh, log logistic workers and so forth. And one of the messages that I want to bring out to those of us who are promoting this kind of clothing is to make 
our own, is to create a self-reliance on our own local communities in order to not just continue and enjoy the, uh, uh, the fruits of this movement by consuming this newfound movement, this newfound culture from importing it from China, but to also participate in it by creating our own uh, clothing as we see uh, from starting our own sewing classes, learning how this clothing is made, and to have people be able to make this kind of clothing to satisfy the local markets and perhaps uh, create from there something uniquely our own and local and representative of our diaspora. So what does it mean to have a Malaysian Chinese uh, Hanfu or a Hong Konger Chinese Hanfu or Canadian Chinese Hanfu? I look forward to that uh, kind of dialogue in the future and when Hanfu becomes normalized as a common category of fashion around the world from here on into the future. So once again, uh, we want to congratulate the Hanfu movement uh, into stepping into its 19th year of its uh, promotion. And I will leave you with a word of a warning, actually, or a caution before we close off the statement, is that um, we must look as well to the last Hanfu movement before the, the one that started before uh, Wang Letian wore uh, his set of uh, homemade clothes and stepped onto the streets in 2003. The earlier Hanfu movement happened in 1911 to 1914 or so, the early days of the Republic of China. The reason why we don't hear much about it is because despite the individual acts of elite scholars who understood the meaning of Hanfu and took it to the streets, much like we did. What they did not have was, aside from the lack of uh, commodification that we had experienced, the other thing was that uh, it was hijacked by this mainstream media opinion. So what happened was when Yuan Shikai, uh, the president of China, the first official president of China, because as you know, Sun Yat-sen was temporary president, but then in order to trade for actual firm military support, he had to give up his presidential position to Yuan Shikai in Beijing, or Peking at the time. And what happened was uh, on winter solstice day, or December 22nd, 23rd of 1913, uh, Yuan Shikai made uh, his officials dress in, well, the closest thing they could get to Hanfu at the time, uh, and paid his sacrifices to uh, at the Temple of Heaven. And there was a lot of, uh, of international press and photos were involved. We can still see them today from American pho photo archives. And what happened was, after that, he declared himself emperor, half about half a year later. And of course, uh, to those who know the end of the story, everyone in uh, China said no, even his former and most ardent supporters, and he died of a broken heart, as uh, the intro to Chinese history uh, courses would say. And what happened in that legacy was, that kind of clothing that he wore, that everybody remembered, uh, was then, uh, that Hanfu was then labeled and deemed as uh, an imperialistic uh, drags of uh, imperial China, the feudalistic uh, things that we should throw behind and cast away in the uh, dustbin of history. So as we look ahead to the uh, ongoing events and the deepening rifts between the actions of Xi's regime, in China and its support for nationalistic discourse and picking up Hanfu or Huafu as its support 
we should be very careful about uh, not having uh, this kind of thing being conflated and bandwagoned together. And in case the C regime really leaves a bad name or bad legacy to half of the world and its impressions, we don't want the Hanfu movement to be uh, dragged along with that as well. Despite the fact that we know uh, a lot of people who uh, keep on saying and promote that Chinese people, Chinese culture is not the CCP, uh, it is difficult sometimes uh, when things come from push into shove that uh, ultimately more or less it will be affected. So it is important for us in the uh, Western Hemisphere, in not, not China, in the uh, outside world uh, and the diaspora, that we should grab that discourse now and speak our minds and speak our values into this kind of clothing and contribute our parts into the Hanfu movement that, that describes our heritage and our identity and our purpose for revering our uh, arts, our culture, our practices, and our clothing. And put that legacy and that lesson, what we've learned about losing this kind of clothing, about regaining it, and learning about how to respect this kind of culture for ourselves, and project them into the future. So once again, my name is Yuri Ye, I'm representing the Hanfu movement of Eastern Canada here in Toronto. Thank you for uh, listening, and uh, I'll see you all in the future with uh, further events. And uh, happy 19th to the Hanfu movement.